You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. This episode is supported by FX's Dear Mama, the saga of Afini and Tupac Shakur. This deeply personal five-part docuseries from award-winning director Alan Hughes shares an illuminating saga of mother and son. She was a revolutionary, intellect, and leader in the Black Panther Party. He was a rapper and political visionary who became known as one of the greatest rap artists of all time. FX's Dear Mama, all new Fridays on FX. Stream on Hulu. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Dear Culture, the podcast for Bite About Black Culture here at the Real Black Podcast Network. I'm your host, Panama Jackson. And today we have another special guest, which I say every single time because every guest is special here at Dear Culture. But today I also really mean it because we have somebody I've known for years, a friend, somebody who is killing the game who uh, I've never really had a chance to tell that, though I see you at every random event I go to uh, that has anything to do with music. You you probably got in free to everywhere I pay, but listen, that's just life. She's been at Spotify, uh, Facebook and Instagram, which I definitely want to talk about. She's been at Revolt, MTV, you worked at Def Jam at one point. I saw Noontime Records. Listen, my guest today is somebody who you clearly need to know who is handling things behind the scenes. My guest today is none other than Whitney Gail Betta. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? Uh, hey. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so glad we finally were able to make this happen. So it's extra special for me to be able to bring friends of mine on here, somebody I know personally who's doing such amazing work in a space that I've always been extremely interested in uh, when it comes to the music industry, just that world. Like, I'm a writer, so I kind of work my way in that way, writing about music and culture. But people who are actually making the music move or making the culture move behind the scenes. So I kind of want to start at where you are now, because it sounds like the most amazing job title of all time. I don't know what it means. I don't know what it has to do with. But my goodness, you are currently the chief music officer or is it musical officer or chief music yeah, officer? Chief music officer. OK, chief music officer at Jukebox which again, sounds like the most amazing job title of all time. So two questions. One, what is Jukebox and what does the chief music officer do at Jukebox? Actually, what it is, it's a music and technology company that will allow fans as well, fans of music and general public to be able to buy and sell shares of artist song royalties. So oh, wow. this is a new, completely new aspect of the music industry that um, is literally opening up a whole new world that I, people in the music industry are are even confused. Like, wait, what is this? So this is really on the precipice of innovation um, as we really open up this new world of Web3. So my role as a chief music officer, um, and funny enough, there's actually only been so far, at least on record and um, publicity uh, of chief music officers, John Legend um, and Steve Aoki. So it just wow. in terms of official titles. So it's funny if you Google chief music officer, there's not a lot of us, but there have been some new articles that have been bubbling up about, you know, what is this new role and what does it mean? And a lot of it's pointed towards more advertisement. But my role at chief, as a chief music officer, honestly, is to to be that anchor within our company um, as it become as it it pertains to our connection with the music artists. Um, I've worked in music for 20 plus years. So fortunately I've garnered a lot of goodwill and built a lot of relationships with artists and managers. So I've really, you know, long existing relationships. So my role is to talk to the music community um, externally, sharing with them what, um, what this new music ecosystem is gonna look like uh, uh, many times we've acquired a lot of their catalogs and so telling them about the opportunity and for the future that they have working with Jukebox. For one, that sounds amazing and insane. You're like a liaison to make sure the financial tech people understand the very industry that you all are in to yep. ensure, like you said, maximum results. But you said like, re like investing. So does that mean, let's say I want to buy into, you buy into an artist or like you buy into the the is this going to increase the royalties for artists? I'm wondering by a bunch of people basically buying into the possibility of a return on. I don't know if I'm making any sense now. No, that I say it makes this out perfect loud. sense. I, I, okay. no, I just wanted you to. It, 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 and it's funny. I have this conversation a hundred times a day, and people are just I like, bet. "Wait, it <laughs> makes sense," but like, what does it make sense? It, like, how does it make sense? So, 
what I'll the way I'll explain jukebox is um, for music has long been a, a, a asset class that has been untapped by or by the regular public. There have been kind of three major players. There have been um, record labels, private equity firms, and multinational corporations that have had access to these catalogs to be able to to benefit from it. So now what we're doing is really transformational and basically unlocking the true value that has long existed, that has only, like as I mentioned, has been allowed to to trade amongst these three, um, these group of people. What you probably have been noticing is that a lot of artists are selling their um, their catalogs. You've got like yes. Justin Bieber who sold his catalog for two hundred million, uh, The Weeknd who sold his for seventy five million, and on and on and on. So essentially, what's happening is these private equity firms are understanding that the value um, of these catalogs are continuing to appreciate, and so they see the long term, you know, benefit of this. So what we're doing is we're unlocking this by being able to take a percentage of the royalty stream that comes in and then we're creating um, a music marketplace. So the same way that you would be able to buy shares of Tesla, Apple, um, Microsoft, you'll be able to buy a share of Swag Surf or back that ass up, or whatever it is, or um, <laughs> Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas. So th- that's the way to think about it is that, you know, because long before it, the only way that you would be able to actually be able to own a piece of Justin Bieber's catalog is be one of one, and which means that you'd have to be able to have $200 million. Uh, $200 million. So this will create a fractionalization of artist song royalties so that you'll be able to buy a fractional share of it. The way that you make a profit is that, um, like I said, as a... As a, as a um, as a music marketplace, there's a primary market and as well as there's a secondary market. So as the song value continues to go up, um, you'll be able to, uh, depending on how much shares you buy, just like you would with Microsoft or Apple, you'll be able to not only be um, that one way fan. Remember, like when you think about it, the traditionally the way that we've been fans are by buying merch, um, right. uh, ticket sales and streaming. So now you can truly say like, I'm in, so technically you've always been an investor in your favorite artist, right? Insert whoever. But now you can really truly say, I'm an investor in you. You know, I'm investing in, in, in your, your catalog and your song royalties. And so, um, so this doesn't touch anything that has to do with an artist uh, publishing or uh, master recordings. This doesn't t- t- touch that at all. Um, and just to give you a little bit of historical context, this is, an, this is a relatively new concept for us, but this is not something that is just like kind of out of the blue. In 1997, um, David Bowie did something that was called the Bowie Bonds. He took all 25 songs of um, his catalog. Now, if you think about it, which artists now actually have 25 albums? But essentially what he did was um, he was able to raise $25 million, I'm sorry, $50 million off of the uh, 25 songs that he did. Now, what he did was he created a music ecosystem. However, what how he differentiated is that it wasn't a done at scale. It was part of his 25 albums, which is nothing to snooze at, right? But what we're doing at uh, Jukebox is we're, we're, this is gonna allow us to create something at scale. I like to say that, think about if Robin Hood and Spotify had a baby. Okay. And so, you know what I mean? Like, so right. that when you wrap your head around that, you're like, OK, it makes sense. So with the Bowie bonds, what he did was it wasn't a regulatory framework. What we're doing is we're doing this by the book so that each individual song is IPO would individually is put through the reggae process so that it becomes a registered asset with the SEC. The other differentiator for this compared to the Bowie bonds, just to kind of give um, a little context, is that it wasn't open to the regular public. And so this will be open to the general public. Um, and if you think about that, the the demand um, is huge. There are 80 million inv- individual investment accounts um, in the U.S. alone. So there's eight, so we think Fidelity, Schwab, E-Trade, Robinhood, right? Now, $13.8 billion is traded on a daily basis. So, um, (laughs) right. And I think it's like 3 point trillion is a year. But the point about that is they're trading the Apples, they're trading the Microsoft, they're trading all these other things. The one thing that's not part of that 
is this new alternative asset class, which is music. And if you think about it, music is something that we all have a connection to, whether or not you're the biggest music fan or just like somebody who's a passive listener. I don't care if it's roll, roll, roll your boat, or like I said, or swag surf, or like dance with my father. We all have these emotional connections to music one way or another in our life. And so imagine being able to tap into those 80 million investors um, and then being able to to own a, a, a share of something that you actually care about. Not to say that you right. don't care about Apple, because I'm sure we <laughs> all have an iPhone or right. an Android. But my point is that like something that, that it really has an emotional um, you know, connection for you. Yeah, that sounds both super fascinating and like overwhelming as a mug. Like just the idea of all of these songs. And so I get like why you have to like get buying for people's catalogs and all this stuff. And also, thank you for mentioning, I've been trying to understand why in the world all these artists are selling their catalogs so early, right? Because, you know, the understanding is that your catalog, your masters is what continues to provide financial well being for you in the future. But if they're going to do these probably actuarial things to figure out, OK, here's your future potential earnings. We'll give you that 300 million now that you're going to get, you know, over the course of your lifetime. We'll give you that now. You just give us you give us access to your catalog and boom, like which 300 million for. a I mean, I see all these artists who are selling for, you know, extreme amounts. It's like, listen, if you'd rather sit on that three right now or wait till you get it over time, like I get it. But I've been so confused, like where this came from, because it, it almost seemed like it comes out of nowhere. Like I, I keep seeing articles about it. Or was seeing all these articles and these and these artists would sell it. I'm just like, nobody's really explaining to me why they're doing this. I just keep seeing it happening, and I don't understand yeah. where, where or why it's come, where or why it's coming from. You know what I mean? So and, that's helpful. And honest, yeah. And I mean, and honestly, this is one reason. I mean, I think artists have their own individual reasons why it could be. Some of them are just kind of like, let me cash out now because I may not necessarily be able to get this later. Or they see the runway that they're going to also create more music. So fine, this is, I'm selling X amount right now, but I know that I have three or four more albums within me. And so let me just cash this out. Let me do some investment. Um, some of them might be in debt, like whatever the case may be. Right. So again like i said what a big differentiator for us is that we are doing this in a regulatory framework so this is not any of that ftx crazy crypto nft stuff this is like literally by the book sec regulated listen i'm all in i look forward to learning and reading more about that because it, it generally does sound fascinating to me so i'm right, yeah. gonna take a quick break here and then we're gonna come back and i kind of want to start how start talking about how you got here to begin with so stay tuned here on dear culture So I was reading your bio. I can't even remember where this was, but somewhere. And I did not realize at Spelman. So you and I met in college. You went to Spelman, went to Morehouse. You created your own major, which was music yeah. industry studies. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So did you always major. know you wanted to be in the music industry? I did. I did. I, I, I'm, actually, I don't want to say I always did, but it was something when I was in high school Um that I fortunately landed an internship um, unexpectedly. And um, each internship led to another to another. And I realized that like entertainment was gonna be my track. It was just, it was, it was thrilling to me. And um, I knew that I wanted to be in the ecosystem. I don't think I necessarily knew per se what I wanted to do. When I was a kid, I used to just tell my mom, like, I just want a big office corner office and I just want to yell at people that was literally what I wanted to do which is kind of crazy now that I think about it um especially working from home now I thought so like first I'm yelling at is my toddler or rather he's yelling at me but um <laughs> I knew that I wanted to write and but I knew that I wanted to be in the um in the music space because I was a musician um as a kid I played the violin and piano and I DJed but I knew that I wasn't really fulfilled um being a musician, um, it's too much anxiety. Um, but I loved being behind the scenes and supporting uh, musicians. And so to me, that was way more gratifying or or just the arts, period. I don't want to say just the musicians because it's I've also done stuff um, with the actors and actresses. So, you know, but that is really was the impetus for it. But yeah, I created my own major at Spelman. Um, it's funny because Spelman being a liberal arts college, 
um, they, you know, while they, they, it ran the gamut, music and entertainment was not some, well, music was a major, but it wasn't right. kind of like music business as we think of it today. It was literally like, if you want to sit there and still play the violin or, you know, traditional instruments, but there was nothing necessary for the business side of things. And when I did go into Spelman, I was still playing the violin my freshman year. Um, and I have a tendency to be a person who kind of, you know, kind of goes to the beat of her own drum. And so in the application for Spellman, um, it was in a very light italics, um, but it basically said like an independent major. And I was curious because I wasn't sure necessarily what I was going to do. I just knew I wanted to go to Spellman. And so I was going to okay. figure it out one way or another. And so when I got there and I investigated, like, what is this? They really told me that a lot of people, you know, basically nobody has done it. And I think I probably might have been one of the first people to ever do an independent major. And so okay. essentially what it was is I created my own curriculum. Um, I had to find advisors uh, to support me um, at the school. And the idea was I was I knew I was like, I want to be in the music industry. So I basically created this curriculum that outlined the courses that I thought that I needed to take. So I not only took classes at Spelman, I took classes at Morehouse as well as Clark Atlanta. So to me, I wanted to cover, you know, every aspect of entertainment. Um, as I was trying to figure out my way. And so um, Dr. Johnson, who was a, who, who is a pianist at uh, Spelman, was my music advisor. And then I also had an econ advisor at Spelman. I can't remember the teacher's name. But essentially, to me, that was the way of putting music business together. So I created a proposal, um, you know, showed classes that you wanted to take um, and what you expect the end result to be. And I got approved. That's fascinating. I mean, I to for one to have the wherewithal to create that and to do that at, you know, 18 years old or whatever like is is I mean, that's special. That 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 level of of vision, you know, at that cuz most of us just showed up to school like I right, grab a major of the the list that they provide. Um, you know, if that changes while I'm there, then I'll change with that, but then I got to, you know, the idea to think of an industry to be a part of and then create a way to do it. Uh like I wish I had no I wish I wish I had this conversation back then because I'm like man I would like to do this like I wish I had you know I I made all these discoveries about myself later you know what I mean about writing and all this stuff I didn't you know I'm a writer I never wrote for the Maroon Tiger or anything like that it just wasn't anything that I did you know I just, was an econ and math and stuff like that but um yeah I'm just I just think that's awesome and it led you to MTV is that because is that yeah. the first big job well, you got out of college? No, it was actually it was um, Def Jam. So um, okay. I got it. I was working for a management company um, at the time. I was working for a woman in Atlanta while we were still in school by the name of LaRonda Sutton, who was the um, SVP for Edmonds Music Publishing, and then was leaving to go to Universal Music Publishing at the same time um, in New York. And at the same time, she. Uh, had a management company called All of a Sudden, and I was um, working on that arm of things. And um, so she said to me, like, well, what are you going to do when you graduate? And I was like, I don't know. I'm just trying to figure it out. Like, <laughs> I'll get there in a second. Let me just, like, graduate. And then, you know, I figured I was going back to New York. Um, and so as such, um, you know, she took it upon herself. You know, I, I guess I was... a, a a, a great team member for her, but she reached out to one of her best friends who was the vice president of marketing at Def Jam and was like, listen, you got to take care of my girl. And um, so I literally was in a, a class at Morehouse. Uh, this uh, gentleman, I'm sure you were familiar, Dr. Anderson's class. I was trying to get yes. an easy A. Yes. Yep. Um, art so I was, was like in the, the, class. the art something or other. <laughs> right. All you had to do was show up and you got an A. So I was like, all right, I'm going to do this class. <laughs> so literally, and I was on my two-way pager at the time and I got a text message from uh, LaRonda and she said, you know, when you graduate from uh, school, you'll have a job at Def Jam. Never interviewed for it, never did anything. I literally was like, oh, snap. And I shared it with like the, my friend who was sitting next to me and we're like, what? Like, you know, like I said, it it was a blessing, but I think it also speaks to the relate what the music industry is about, which is about having relationships and having, you know, a good reputation. So cut to graduate um, sometime May 2021. Um, two weeks later, I moved back to my hometown, New York City, Harlem, New York. 
And I start working as a marketing assistant at Def Jam two weeks after graduating from college, which what I think about it is insane. Like there was no break. There was no time to really be, to enjoy graduating and to be a kid. Like I literally was like thrust into the deep end of the pool of working with some of the biggest artists in music. And, you know, now that I look back and I look at photos, I'm like, well, you had no business to do it. You, like, I was literally a kid who just graduated from school and I'm, um, you know, working with DMX and working with Ja Rule and working with the Shanti and like Jay-Z wow. and, you know, Ludacris. And so it was it was a little rough in terms of trying to adjust, but that was my first job um, out at, at of, um, at a school and you know i got a chance to uh fortunately be a part of working on the blueprint uh which everybody knows it was one of jay-z's probably most um heralded albums uh during that time and you know there's also so much going on in the world in new york and 9-11 and all that so um but i was there for two and a half years um and like I said, it it was definitely music industry boot camp. It was not for the faint of heart. And um, but that's really where I cut my teeth um and really learned the true definition of like having thick skin. Um, I'll spare everybody all the details of that, but I mean I'm I'm definitely a, a better person for it. Um and then I uh I had a colleague of mine who was our counterpart with MTV and BET and um music choice at the time and there was an opening to be a music uh, coordinator at MTV News. And so she came to me and was like, you know, again, you know, it's almost like I've had all these angels, fortunately, um, to really support my career, who was like, so what are you trying to do? And I was like, I don't know, like just working, trying to figure it out. And she's like, you know, there's this job at MTV, you know, to be a talent booker. And I think you can do it. I didn't even know what a talent booker was. And so, but she's she like, that you faith have the Right, exactly. So she was like, you have the gift of gab. All the artists love you at Def Jam. All the artists know you. And so the idea was like, and then at the time, everybody at MTV was trying to book Def Jam artists. So her thing was like, you'll figure it out when you get there. Right. And I was like, oh, OK. So going over to Def I'm going over to MTV. That was 2003. I don't really know what I was doing, but it what was really funny is for like maybe like the first year and a half, the Def Jam artists, which was a lot of the artists that I booked, were like, "Do you work? Where do you work? Are you at MTV or are you at Def Jam? Because like we're here all the time and we always <laughs> see you, and you know." And so anyway, I started as a coordinator. I was at MTV News and Docs for ten years, and I left as a vice president. Um, and I I really learned. Uh, the inner workings of the music industry as well as the television industry. And like that was, that was probably the, some, one of the best times of my career. And I can say that because who would stay at a job now for 10 years? Like now it seems like so like, you know, taboo to stay at a place for 10 years. But it was, I felt like you worked at like United Benetton. There was people of every single color, walk of life, you know, sexual orientation, um, there was just so much freedom to be able to, you know, express your differences. And like, I think it was actually um, encouraged that like our different walks of life helped us provide different perspectives um, to make great television programming. Um, and so while I was there, I moved up the ranks. I learned how to make good television. Um, I worked on some of the most heralded uh, television shows on MTV, it was um, the My Block series. Um, okay. I got a chance to do um, a, a documentary with D- Jay Z that was called Water for Life, and um, where we did a press conference to announce the the um, documentary at the UN, and then ended up also premiering it um, at the UN um, with the Secretary General Kofi Annan. I did a documentary, did two documentaries at Kanye West. The first documentary with Drake, My Time, um, is better better than good enough. Um, Nicki Minaj, My Time Now, uh, Demi Lovato, as well as Lady Gaga. So um, it, it was such an amazing time for me um, in really understanding, you know, television and music and blending, you know, two passions of mine. So 
so here, so it's funny that you say that you know it was the greatest time of your life because what I what I was curious about and it's kind of forays into moving into places like what I guess Spotify and Facebook and all the like you know it seems like after you leave MTV like it's just like on and popping like you just like you know you're you're going to these places that at least from the outside in we're all like these are the it places to be from Revolt and all like all this stuff right but back then current oh let me let me say it this way currently like taking up space as a black woman is like like that's just a thing right like it's like you know you we we are we are loud in speaking about these things and and black women's voices seem to be being heard more than it seems like ever before back then i wouldn't think so as much so i was curious about like as a black woman in these spaces that you are ascending the ranks or going up the ladder on like was it ever difficult or was it something that because of who you are and the relationships that you built like you were able to ascend that ladder in a way that didn't make you feel marginalized or diminished in any way so what I'll say is to go back to um, that foundation that I had um, at MTV, um, it was a utopia. It was a, and okay. I was very fortunate, you know, to be in this place that I said it was like United Nations of, uh, you know, United Benetton, you know, um, where your ideas were heard because every no one person looked the same. So it was like there was, we were such a melting pot. So as a black woman, um and there were a lot of young black men at the um, at the time at the company, but as the only black woman in my role, I definitely um, my word and my thoughts carried weight, and I didn't know any different. Like I'll give you an example. Um, this was when I so a lot of times when new artists were like um, trying to break into MTV. Um, they would come through MTV News because we had these like 10 to the hour spots um, that were like kind of like no harm, no foul. It was just kind of like a little blurb. And so that was kind of like the easiest point of entry. And then like, you know, you know, you made it when you were like on TRL. I remember um, one of, you know, my now mentors, Troy Carter, who at the time was managing uh, Freeway Eve, like he really kind of came out of that era. But he called me I'll never forget it was a Sunday and he called me I was driving back over 95 uh north uh, back to New York from Maryland and he said um I got this new girl named Lady Gaga and I was like what the heck is a Lady Gaga and he was like I know just don't even worry about it and but she's amazing I'm gonna send you a link to her MySpace and I want you to check it out and I was like all right and he was like yo could you see if you could give me some love Again, because MTV News was like the easiest point of entry. If like if it failed, maybe a couple of people saw it. Who knew? Right. You know, it wasn't that big of a deal. And so um, this is like right on the brink of like the dot com era where you had now articles that we read on a daily basis. So I remember right. bring, going to our uh, morning editorial news meeting and I said, listen, guys, Troy reached out to me. He's got this artist named Lady Gaga. I don't even know what a Lady Gaga is. I listen to the music is not for me and i'm clear on that but that's like to me that's super important to right. understand that you're not i'm not i'm not the demo right like or shouldn't be actually it should be who's our our audience's you know interest and i was like i don't know i was like it's cool it's not really for me but i can tell you she's gonna be a star and i'll i'll never forget my boss was like what is a lady gaga i was like i don't understand i don't know this hair bow thing like it's a thing, but it, I promise you, we need to do a story on her. She's going to be big. And so, again, she's new, right? So it was like, what's a Lady Gaga? And we took a chance on her. But they trusted me, and they trusted my gut. So that's gotcha. why I say, for me, I got really fortunate because, you know, I could bring something that sounded crazy, and they're like, all right, she she isn't, you know, disappointed us yet. So... I kind of was in this like little utopia, you know, for a minute. And then, um, but for me, it was, it was great. I was there for 10 years and I was trying to figure out like, well, when do you know it's time to leave? You know, because I've had this great experience at this amazing company and I love right. all my coworkers, but I knew I needed to grow. So, um, and quite frankly, I felt like MTV, when I got there, the Bible, I always like to say was already written. Um, and so, 
I was like, I want to really kind of test the skills that I've developed here and like see if this was just like a fluke or if this was like, you know, did I really like make an impact? And so at the time, 2013, Puff was about to launch Revolt TV. And um, he was poaching some of my 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 colleagues. And um, he remembered me because obviously he was at MTV all the time. Bad Boy was just right. on the street. <laughs> and her, right, he was always there. And so, you know, he's like, baby girl, you know, I see you all the time whenever I'm here. You know, I always have a great experience. Um, and I know what you do, you know, and I want to do the same thing. I want to basically make Revolt as big as MTV, if not bigger. And um, for me, that was exciting. I I really I try to pay that. attention yeah, to yeah, and I try to pay attention to pop culture. I try to pay attention to like what is buzzing out in the world. And for me, I saw that like um, startups and you know startup culture and digital were like these big buzzy words. And I was like, well, how do I get some of that? So you know when I found out like also how often it, were television networks going to be launching anymore I knew this was going to be the end of television because you kept hearing about cord cutting so I was like let me take a chance and be able to create you know write the bible myself you know and so I jumped and and, and took a chance and went over to Revolt TV to to launch this network yeah that's amazing I right, want to take a quick break here we come back I want to talk about doing that and moving to play i really want to talk about spotify here because i i'm so fascinated by that i keep using the word fascinated but it is true because this is a world un, that i'm unfamiliar with so we're going to take a quick break we'll come right back and we'll get more into your story here on dear culture i wrote back here at dear culture with whitney gail benta who is uh a music exec who has been in all these spaces that you are familiar with uh perhaps in roles we don't even understand how they exist or what they exist to do but you know, one of the places that you've been on your journey, which includes, you know, Revolt, Facebook and Instagram is Spotify, which, you know, everybody and their mama uses Spotify, even if you don't even intend to nowadays, it's all over the place. You see Spotify branding at every festival like it's a it's a thing. And let me get this right. You are the global head of artist and talent relations, right? Yes. So one, what does that mean? And what what were you doing? It is. And there's a second part to this question because I had an artist on recently on, on the podcast and I was talking, she's a black country music artist. And we were talking about how a lot of those artists don't seem to like really con like get into the ecosystem of like pop star, like get on all the playlists and stuff like that. And it was interesting because we were just talking about like how there's a fight on the for country, like fight on the acceptance side from like the white country establishment. But then there's like the acknowledgement from the black music establishment and how like, and I was like, I wonder how this even happens, like with spaces that curate all these playlists and how people even get onto these things that I think you would know better yeah. than I would help break artists nowadays. Like, I would assume that's how some of that stuff happens. But I'm just curious about your role in Spotify, just your like your thoughts about like gatekeeping, I suppose, in general in the music industry with streaming and how it exists now. Okay. Okay, you, you said a lot. It's a so big I'll, questions, I know. It's a big I'll question. Lie, I uh, I'll try to break it down bite size. I can tell you the quick story. Okay. Um, and I'm glad I shared the story about Troy Carter and Lady Gaga because that comes full circle when it comes to how I got to Spotify. So uh, Troy ended up having an amazing career um, with Lady Gaga and making her into, um, helping to help make her into the, the huge megastar that she is now. Um Troy Carter is also a very well-known uh, venture capitalist, so he's always like a, an extreme visionary Troy when Carter it comes from, to the he future. He was on uh, what, Shark Tank. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that Troy Carter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the glass. He, the, yeah, okay. I know you're talking about it. Billy's yeah, right. own. Billy's yes, own. Yes, yes. Um, okay. So Troy, who introduced me to Lady Gaga and asked me to, you know, give him, you know, some help with, you know, getting her MTV. Um, was the global head of creator services um, at Spotify, as well as being an early investor at Spotify. Wow. And so obviously we stayed in touch, you know, throughout the matriculation of my career. And um, he said, hey, listen, Spotify is continuing to scale. And um, as we're getting bigger, 
you know, our ability to really kind of um, have that those touch points with artists and managers, um, we're losing it. Um, and I want you to bring some of your MTV flavor to. Uh, so it's so funny. I laugh when I tell the story because it's like it was a real full circle moment. Right. You know, um, and he's like, I want to bring I want you to bring some of that MTV energy that you had that if we knew we were coming to MTV, um, Whitney, Elena, whoever was there, they're going to be all right. I want that to be uh, what happens at Spotify, that when an artist knows that they're coming up to Spotify for a meeting. Oh, Whitney's there. So and so is there. We're good. Gotcha. So that was literally my kind of like, you know, my role in terms of what I was told. Now, what happens, of course, when you get to a job is, you know, always different. And so um, it, this was a global company, first of all, you know, um, that was continuing to grow. And so scaling my relationships on a, on a global uh, stage is, is quite difficult. Um, but I was able to... Um, figure it out and the idea was really actually taking some of the dna from mtv of creating what we called like this car wash so that when an artist did come to mtv i'm excuse me when the artist did come to spotify they were doing all the things whether it's photos you know setting up a music meeting um you know with their editors um doing a podcast and such and so that was really what my my initial role was to go into um at at Spotify and also just making sure that we're creating a good sentiment with the artists and management community that they felt like they were being supported because you had now Apple title was coming, you know, Amazon Pandora, uh, Pandora. So we wanted to make sure that like we were the place that we were the number one place for, um, for, for artists and partners that they felt like, you know, Spotify, they know us, they understand us. Gotcha. And the last the last question I had, which was just about kind of like, like how did those algorithms and things work? I, I ain't asking for the special sauce. I understand you got you know the NDAs and all that stuff, but you know, like I said, I'm just curious about how people end up on all these playlists that I think end up creating spaces and opportunities for artists. Like I learn about I learn about artists nowadays through playlists, right? Like when I'm trying to find music to listen to, I'll just go through and I'm like, let me hit this hit this playlist to see what's on here. And I'm like, oh, this is amazing. Then I hit like the little radio button and I go off into all these spaces and I'm getting old. So my capacity to remember them all is not what it used to be like. Yeah. Unless they really, unless they really hit. But, you know, what's it like being at a place like Spotify that is breaking all of these artists? And I imagine folks are constantly reaching out to y'all like, yo, I'm trying to get a spot somewhere. You know, I have a, I have a younger brother who, I remember the first time he ended up on a on a Spotify playlist. Like, dude, literally texted the entire family, like, "Yo, bro, I made it. I'm on a playlist." And I'm like, "Which one?" It's like a million, but I'm happy for you. Like, you know, I, yeah. but it was it was an accomplishment for him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, what's that like being a space that it, helps create that? You know, it, it's it's gratifying um, to be able to help say that you're a part of the story of allowing or helping an artist to to get their music to be heard by by so many at the time when I was leaving Spotify um and obviously this uh is is probably increased since then but there's a hundred thousand songs that are ungested a day Jeez. right like let that sink in and so can it's impossible for one person, let alone a team of people, to be able to listen to that. So I remember getting emails where an artist would reach out and say, like, thank you so much. In many cases, I had nothing to do with it, you know. <laughs> and because it truly is, you know, it has to be an algorithm. Otherwise, nobody would be able to see their families. You know what I mean? Um, right. And also making sure that they are um, really, um, what's the word I'm trying to use? Um, labeling their their music the correct way. Like if you're a jazz artist, you're not gonna put like, hey, I should be on rap caviar. No, you know what I mean? I'm just being facetious, but the point right. is that like knowing it, what helps, um, or at least what helped on you know the editorial side is that you it, it allows, you know, the Spotify team to be able to find help you find your audience better. 
you know, and, you know, obviously who doesn't want to be on today's top hits or, you know, um, you know, taste or rap caviar, but you have to go to where your true audience is. So, it, you know, 100,000 songs a day is insane. And so insane. there's going to be some, yeah, so there's going to be some that are going to be good and then a lot of them are really bad. You know, and I think what we'd always have to remind people is that, like, the cream rises to the top. And, you know, people are artists. And as Erica says, you know, I'm sensitive about my ish. And so with that being said, not everybody's going to make it. But I think the thing that I would always encourage artists is that, like, you know, granted, gone are the days of the old way that the music industry was um, uh, existed. But now... You know, your street team exists in your phone, you know, exists in your contacts. It exists, you know, with your social media. And so galvanize, you know, the people that are your true fans, you know, invest, continue to invest in them. A lot of times I think, unfortunately, social media makes us think about like, you know, you eventually want to get to a place where, you know, you're superstardom, but you got to continue to pour into um, your fans. I think a person who did it really, really well, and um, he's no longer with us, but um, in the early days of everybody trying to figure out this world was Mac Miller. Mac right. Miller utilized YouTube. He utilized social media. He'd be like, okay, guys, so guess what? We're going to have part two of such and such and such. Nobody really knew about part one, but okay. He knew how to market himself, <laughs> right? You know what yeah, I mean? He was good like, at that. Yeah. He was really good at that, and he made you, like, anticipate what was going to come next and so i think you know now this new age of music industry you have to have some hustle you have to have some grit which is crazy because it's a little bit of an oxymoron of like i think how things exist now everybody lives in very much a microwave society where they want everything handed to them they want to be beyonce tomorrow they want to be a music executive yesterday after being an intern for one day you know what i mean like you got to go get that cheesecake. You got to pay your dues. Right. Look, that's all. Yeah, that's great. And I, that those gems that you provided, I think will be helpful to anybody listening who's interested in making a rent. All right, we'll take one last break here and we'll come back with our Black Festes of Black Medations and find out where you can keep up with the world of this wonderful exec here, Whitney Gale Benta, right here on Dear Culture. All right, we're back here on Dear Culture with our final segments, which are my favorite here on Dear Culture. And that's because we love to say as black people that we are not a monolith. Well, here's our chance to prove it. We do black fashions, which is a confession about your blackness, which is something that people might be surprised to know about you because you are black. Do you have a black fashion for us? Yes. All right, my what black you got? fashion. <laughs> my black fashion is um, I am a West Indian. My my father's side is from Trinidad, Antigua, St. Kitts. Uh, and I absolutely hate, like, soca and really game music. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. There's New certain York? songs. I know. There's certain, there's certain songs I like, but, like, real talk, if you want to get me off a dance floor, I'd be like, all right, let me go sit down. And I, and I, and I cringe because I'm like, I know my grandmother is, like, rolling over in her grave right now. <laughs> You know, I'm like, but yeah, I can't, I can't stand it. I got to say thank you for that because that's a real black fashion. That's like cultural and personal. Like that's, that's where you come from. And you like, yeah, I just, that, you know, that, thank you. That is a real share. (laughs) That is, I feel like that's a real, a real share. (laughs) All right. Well, to counteract the black fashions that people share here. We also ask for a black recommendation, which is a recommendation by for it about something black. Be anything, something you like to support, something you think other people should support, something you might have yeah. going on, whatever it is that is by for it about black culture. Do you have a black recommendation for us? Ah, uh, yeah. I would say my black recommendation is um I really love athleisure wear. Um I'm wearing some now. Um, one of the brands that I love is a good friend of mine named Ashley Muhammad, um, who owns a clothing line called Be Iconic, um, which is all about like uh, she's a female black entrepreneur from Harlem. Um, I love all her sweatpants and sweat gear. 
I'm constantly rocking it. You probably see it all over my Instagram, my green sweatsuit, a blue sweatsuit. Um, and so um, I've been inspired by her um, and, and and her movement of entrepreneurialism. I'm really following her passion. So that would be my recommendation. Uh, check out beiconic.com. All right. We'll make sure that we do that. Um, where can people keep up with what you got going on? How can people keep up with the experience that is you? Um, the way that they can keep up with me is my all my socials are I am Whitney Gale, um, Instagram, Twitter, not that I'm on there that much, uh, TikTok. I don't do TikToks, but I'm a good foyer. Um and <laughs> uh, and LinkedIn right and then and LinkedIn so um that's where you can catch me um we launch officially uh, for Jukebox uh September twelfth twenty twenty three um and you can go on jkbx dot com already to join the waitlist to learn more about Jukebox um as we continue to grow the company. Thank you so much for joining us here, Dear Culture. You are appreciated. Your story is important. Uh, I love to see people thriving and excelling and taking on job titles that sound like the literal greatest job titles of all time. <laughs> so I don't even know what you could do from here because I don't know. There ain't no title better. I don't know. Maybe CEO is what you want. But chief music okay. officer literally sounds like my dream. So Aww. you are appreciated. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you to everybody for listening to Dear Culture, which is an original podcast of the Real Black Podcast Network. It is produced by Sasha Armstrong, edited by Jeff Trudeau, and Regina Griffin is our director of podcasts. Uh, again, my name is Panama Jackson. Thank you for listening. Have a black one. This episode is supported by FX's Dear Mama, the saga of Afini and Tupac Shakur. This deeply personal five-part docuseries from award-winning director Alan Hughes shares an illuminating saga of mother and son. She was a revolutionary, intellect, and leader in the Black Panther Party. He was a rapper and political visionary who became known as one of the greatest rap artists of all time. FX's Dear Mama, all new Fridays on FX. Stream on Hulu. I'm political scientist, author, and professor, Dr. Christina Greer, and I'm host of The Blackest Questions on the Griot's Black Podcast Network. This person invented ranch dressing around 1950. Who are they? I have no idea. This all began as an exclusive Black History trivia party at my home in Harlem with family and friends. And they got so popular, it seemed only right to share the fun with our Griot listeners. Each week, we invite a familiar face on the podcast to play. What was the name of the person who was an enslaved chief cook for George Washington and later ran away to freedom? In 1868, this university was the first in the country to open a medical school that welcomed medical students of all races, genders, and social classes. What university was it? No, th this is why I like doing stuff with you because I leave educated. I was not taught this in Alabama public schools. Question yeah. number three, you ready? Yes, let me okay. try to redeem myself. How did we go from Kwanzaa to like, these obscure you know, ass sport, darling. You this know, is sport. like the New York Times crossword from a Monday to a Saturday right or wrong because all we care about is the journey and having some fun while we do it i'm excited and also a little nervous oh listen no need to be nervous and as i tell all of my guests this is an opportunity for us to educate ourselves because black history that. is american history so we're just gonna have some fun listen some people get zero out of five some people get five out of five it doesn't matter we're just gonna be on a little intellectual journey together look toya cantrell that's right mary okay. toya cantrell hercules posey mm. Born in 1754, and he was a member of the Mount Vernon slave community, widely admired for his culinary skills. I'm going to guess Afro punk. Close. It's okay. Afro Nation. So I've never last heard year, of that. according to my research, it's Samuel Wilson, aka Falcon. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. I, I am. I am disputing this. I'm very, 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 very 99.9999 99 sure that it is Representative John Lewis, who is also from the state of Alabama. That lets you know, Christina, we got some goodness come out of Alabama. There is something in the water in Alabama, and you are absolutely correct. The harder they come. Close. 
Oh, wait, uh, the harder they fall? That's right. I'm one of those people that, that just changes one word. <laughs> I mean, I know this show too well. I just don't know nothing today. It's I'm going to pour myself a little water while you tell me the answer. The answer is Seneca Village, which began in 1825 with the purchase of land by a trustee of the AME Zion Church. You know why games like this make me nervous? I don't know if I know enough black. Do I know enough? How black am I? Oh, my Lord. They, they gonna, we going to find out in public. So give us a follow, subscribe, and join us on The Blackest Questions.